delegates and guests. It is with great pleasure that I introduce our next guest to you. His name is Patrick Egan. Patrick Egan is the editor of the America's Desk at Small Unmanned Aircraft System News and host and executive producer of the Small Unmanned Aircraft System News podcast series. He serves as the president of the Silicon Valley chapter of Association of Unmanned Vehicle Systems International. He also consults to the U.S. Army Space and Missile Defense Command Battle Lab. Patrick has been in the unmanned aircraft field for over eight years, working as a proponent for the business use of unmanned aircraft. If you would please join me in giving our next speaker, Patrick Egan, a warm welcome. Something 
the military was interested in, and I worked for um, the Navy, the Office of the Secretary of Defense. We did uh, what was called forest protection, where we actually did remote sensing and gathered intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance. And that was part of this program. I also worked for the Army Space and Missile Defense Command Battle Lab in Colorado Springs. That was a lot of fun. I got to uh, do experiments and things like that, and I like to engineer solutions for problems. When I worked for the Navy and the Army, what I did is I, I was the flight crew chief. Well, actually, I was an instructor for the, for the Navy on a system like this. It's lighter than air. It's an aerostat. It flew a, plat or a, a payload that you could, let's say, watch the flew a big camera. And also, it was a relay for communications. Same thing I did for the Army. Uh, most of our testing was done with uh, communications and network packages that we could fly and relay uh, communications and whatnot uh, for testing as part of NIE, which is the um, Network Integration Exercise of White Sands Missile Range. Again, getting to go to White Sands Missile Range. Um, for me, it was really exciting. That was kind of where the birthplace of American space started there. A lot of other testing. There's all, they're always flying missiles. And then also, of course, uh, the Manhattan Project and uh, the test site for the you know, nuclear bomb. So there's a lot of history there. So anyway, I don't do any of the military stuff anymore with sequestration. I've moved out of that, and I'm doing only commercial stuff. And as, I, uh, as it was announced, I'm the president of the Silicon Valley Chapter of Association for Unmanned Vehicle Systems International. And what we do, uh, one of the things that we do is we, we kind of advocate for the technology use of uh, robotics, not the aircraft. They're not so heavy on the commercial space, but I, I think there's kind of opportunity in commercial space. We do a couple of student competitions. We have one, this one down here is called the Sea Perch. And it's a kit, people put it together. And while it doesn't look too exciting, what it does is give you an opportunity to build an underwater um, remotely piloted vehicle. And uh, people kind of, uh, I was mentoring a robotics club, and they looked at it and they kind of laughed, whatever else. But after you put it together, and you realize you're going to be operating in a 3D environment that's kind of hostile. And so if you don't, uh, as you're building this thing, if your quality is not up, it's not going to run underwater. So it's kind of an interesting thing to be able to, uh, to one program a robot that moves, you know, and uh, it's down the ground or one plane. But when you start uh, programming systems that are operating in a 3D or 4D environment, it's a lot more challenging. And this is another, we do a student competition uh, with aircraft. And then there's also a robo, uh, robo competition and then a ground robot competition. And so, like I said, what I try and do here is I try and bring all of the different technologies together and all of the, these different people together, and hopefully they can work uh, together on different projects. I always talk about Silicon Valley. People are like, oh, you know, uh, they'll say some other town is the Silicon Valley of some certain technology, but that's just really not the case. I mean, as you guys get to go around Northern California here, you'll probably see and meet people that are a little bit different from the rest of the people in the world. I always call Silicon Valley, I say it's kind of like the Hollywood of technology. And people come here from all around the world that are in technology, and they might have been told by people where they're from that they're crazy. Here, they come here and they're like, I have this idea and I want to do X, Y, Z. And people say, hey, that sounds interesting. I know another guy I'm going to put you in touch with that can help you with that project. I might be able to collaborate with that product and bring it from an idea into a, a, into a product that you can get some venture capital for or maybe bring it to the commercial market. So I don't think it should be discounted. Security technology here in the United place. I don't want to work for like the Visitor Bureau of Silicon Valley. I just believe it from meeting the people here. Like I said, I, I talk about how uh, these systems are kind of the future uh, of now. I mean, in these uh, Boston Dynamics, I don't know if, how closely you guys pay attention to the news, but Google has been acquiring robotics companies. I don't know if anybody's 
you notice that? You guys are going to go over to Ames Research like tomorrow or the next yeah. day soon. You'll notice over there there's a giant hanger. Uh, it doesn't have the skin on it right now. It looks like a big kind of steel frame. And uh, Google is going to pay to refurbish that. And they're going to do their robotics programs. It's huge, huge, this hanger. It's very impressive. You'll see it. And they're going to do their design all these robotics companies. They're talking about a lot of aircraft um, companies. They have a balloon project where they're doing basically what I was doing for the Army, where they're uh, going to be uh, you know, um, broadcasting uh, networks and they want to bring internet to, let's say, areas that don't have infrastructure. A lot of exciting stuff going on with them. A lot of exciting stuff going on with robotics. This, of course, is an underwater uh, robotic vehicle. It's a pretty autonomous program. At and it has uh, sonar, it could be mapping and other things like that. I want to say that's called the Robo Tuna. And then, of course, Elon Musk, this guy is like, he's almost like the new Howard Hughes. Anybody know who Elon Musk is? Okay, a couple of people do. He's making that nice Tesla car. And I'm hoping to get him, you know, reviewing it up, which probably won't happen. He's doing the SpaceX, he's doing Solar City. I mean, this guy is, he's the man. But the thing with the grasshopper that I think is really amazing, anybody see the, the last test launch of the grasshopper? Where they, they lift it off and they set it back down on the bed? That's pretty impressive. That's not only impressive to uh, people that are into technology, it's I mean, the people that are into rocketry are amazed that you can put this rocket back down on the bed. And it's kind of funny, as I was talking to an older gentleman that retired from Aerojet, and he's like, why would you want to put something back down on the bed? Well, it's a $200 million spacecraft, and if you can save it and refuel it, you can use it again. And from a business standpoint of view, or a commercial business standpoint of view, it makes sense to have a reusable launch vehicle. Kind of like what we did with the space shuttle, but there are pieces that fell off. And, uh, usually the old business model was that the government would just buy a new one. Well, here, they want to get that cost down, and I think the cheapest you can get a human brain weighing in the space is like $11,000. They want to bring that down. But they've got satellites, you know, and I, I think it's kind of funny, and they have space grant, and there are actually middle schools and high schools that are sending experiments into space. What they can do when you bring this cost down is that space will be more available to everyone. We're talking about space people, you know, that will be in the $5,000 range. Like the Cuban set, it'll actually be able to be launched into space. And your company someday may be able to have its own satellite and be able to move it around. The difference between a space vehicle and a satellite is that you can put a vehicle that you want in. The satellite is just stationary or static. So those are the types of future that uh, we're looking at here. This one down here is a little... Uh, drone, and it's made by a company called Festo. And I want to I want to play the video if I can, because I just want you to see the the technology that went into this, and you can think about the different disciplines uh, that went into this. It's pretty impressive. So you get the idea on this, <clears throat> looking at it, who would really want to, let's say, a mechanical dragonfly. But this company, and I would suggest that you go to their website, Festo, F-E-S-T-O, they have a 
bunch of organic inspired flying machines. They have a uh, jellyfish and a dolphin and uh, a few other air vehicles, and they also had a jellyfish that they uh, use as water. To think of all of the work <clears throat> and the collaboration that went into making something like a dragonfly that can fly, why does my take that for granted as it is a mechanical or it's a, a natural bio uh, living thing, but when you try and mimic uh, something that's living and existing, you're trying to get that flight that magical work that went into that. Now, next slide. <clears throat> it's a little bit of a joke, but you know the, the future I think is going to be something where you can you can make your own future and your own career and you can decide where you want. You know, you want to put the effort in and you want to be get out. It's not out of the realm of possibility that you could be anyone in this room could be a commercial astronaut. It's not outside the possibility that, in, that anybody in this room could, you know, write code for a robot that goes to uh, one of the on the other part of the planets that are out there during the solar system. Or, you know, somebody that helps design a spaceship or a spacecraft that goes to Mars and back. That is not beyond uh, the realm of possibility. To say, it's just up to you to decide what you want to do. I didn't, you know, with this balloon thing, this wasn't my career. I was a building contractor, a historic remodel contractor. That's what I did for a living. And I got into this uh, this drone thing because I used it to take aerial photography for real estate and for construction projects. So I just kind of stumbled into it. And I said, well, you know, this is exciting technology. I'm into photography. I'm, I'm into technology. I put the two of them together and I started using them. And I, I, so you found a way to make that a business or part of my income stream. <clears throat> and, then, and you can do the same thing. It's out there. You can decide that you want to be a part of uh, robotics or writing code or whatever. And that's available to you guys in your age group to go out and do. And that's about as preachy as I'm going to get on the future of your career. Now I want to kind of talk about some of these drones because that's my primary focus. <clears throat> this picture here is uh, of Martha Stewart's space. Anybody know who Martha Stewart is? Show. She actually owns this drone. And this drone that she owns is this drone here, the DJI Phantom. And there's two ways you can control this. You can either use what uh, most people would recognize as a remote control or an RC uh, controller. But the nice thing about this system, this is my phone. It's huge right now, but uh, everybody kind of laughs at how big my phone is. But the deal is, is that drone sends video back to my phone. So I, I want to have the biggest screen I could possibly have because I want to be able to see the video that's gotten back. So if I was flying and taking this shot, I would see this shot on my phone. Also, they just uh, this company has just uh, developed a new software where I can actually set waypoints on my phone through the app. And uh, this drone will go ahead and I just click one of these, one of these levers here, and it will go and it will fly a pre-programmed, uh, say, flight plan that looks like this. Here's the ground control software. And so uh, this, this really, this ground control is more for the blue one here, which is made by a company that's out of uh, Berkeley. Has anybody heard from me, Robotics? They're pretty popular in the drones. They, they really kind of spun out of the do-it-yourself movement and the internet community. Chris Anderson is uh, well known for, uh, he was the editor of Wired Magazine. I don't know if anybody reads Wired Magazine, but he kind of got into drones and he brought in, a, almost into, like I said, do-it-yourself community and they kind of developed this system. They also developed the autopilot that's in here, and they do what's called an open source code. People have I heard of open source code. Well, they have it for autopilots. And so even this ground station interface is made by this community. So if I wanted to fly that on my laptop, <clears throat> I can set these waypoints. 
over a field, and I can download this into from uh, Google Earth or whatever else, and I can set waypoints where I want the drone to fly. And this is my start and home location, and they can figure out where it is. This thing on the top here is a GPS receiver, and then it basically sends data to the uh, to the ground station via this antenna here. And I can fly around. It doesn't have a camera on it, but I can have a camera on it, and they can have a video down there. So I can see what pictures I, or what I'm taking pictures of, or the video that I'm taking. And this here is a glass compass. Right when that screenshot was taken, obviously the attitude of the aircraft was on its horizontal nurse. There's a lot of data that you can get off of that. It can tell you the altitude, your heading and uh, your battery levels and things like that. So you get some feedback from the room. That would also uh, be the software that we use for this room here. Since I was late, I didn't really have a chance to set it up. But this is a, this is a 3D robotics. This is a fixed looking version. Well, it's about yay big. But uh, this would probably be more conducive to use for agricultural use or some other uses that I'll show you. It's got a, uh, I don't know if I can do it with one hand, but anyway. It's got a uh, camera in the nose, has a video downlink, and it sends that video down to the ground control station. And the P type 2 tells you your airspeed. And again, at the top, if you look in there, you're having. You have your uh, GPS receiver and your autopilot. The stuff in the camera. Uh, again, that would be something you would use for like, these next pictures. I took these pictures with a fixed wing aircraft. I did, uh, this was part of an agricultural job that I did. Um, this is one I just did that went to Disneyland. I <coughs> I did that probably back in 2004 or five. This picture here, I took uh, with an iPhone. And it was actually the first day of photo that I was taken with an iPhone on the ground. Um, at the time, when I built the iPhone to win, I had to overcome a solution to uh, get into fire, take pictures. I don't know if anybody's tried that or tried to take a picture with an iPhone with a glove on or whatever because it doesn't work so well. So we had an engineer solution to work a finger in the air. How I overcame that is I basically had a servo and I put a Q-tip on there. Uh, I cut off the Q-tip and I put the end of that on there. And I made a saline solution and I energized it with about uh, three volts. And for some reason, as long as that uh, Q-tip was wet, and I could put, I wanted to switch it on my remote and get it to fire the camera. But the Q-tip had to stay wet. It's about 110 degrees that day. And out here in California, it's pretty dry, so I had to, I had to move fast. But that was the first aerial photo that I was taking with an uh, iPhone. And there were some interesting comments on one of the, the boards that I can't talk about here. It's a little off uh, color. Anyway, so that was some of the stuff I did. Now, this picture, this plane, I do the SUS news. This is another thing about technology and opportunity. The gentleman that I do the SUS news with, and named Gary Mortimer, lives in the NATO in South Africa. I've actually never met him. I've been doing business with him since about 2009. We just met two weeks ago at the Farnham Rural Air Show for the first time. We just met on the internet and uh, we've had that kind of working relationship over the internet. So he lives here in South Africa. And he uses a fixed wing aircraft. He also has some of these other uh, multi rotors with Utah aircraft. But what he does is he works with the university there. And what they do is track different species of animal. And you can see the jackal here has got a uh, transmitter on his, on his neck. And same with this cat, I don't know what species of cat that is, but anyway. He's also got one. So what happens is, as you can see in the, the terrain there, and in the valleys or whatever, the signal strength is not that, uh, not that 
dollars. And you would have to have repeaters on all of these high peaks for the information from the power to repeat back to the uh, university. They can't afford that infrastructure. Obviously, out here in the wild like this, it would be uh, cost prohibitive to try to set up towers, solar systems, and other things like that. So you could repeat that, uh, or you could repeat that data. So what Gary does is he flies a drone, and that's this drone is drone. This is actually his drone, and I, I brought it for show and tell before I sent it off. But this is actually his drone. He's going to send it to him, and basically what he will do is continue the work that he's doing here with that drone. So something that totally came out of the internet, the relationship that came out of the internet, and it's a do-it-yourself community on the internet, help develop these aircraft that will be go from Berkeley to South Africa to help conservation. The white line is more of a commercial system that was totally developed by a company that has a commercial focus that really, their focus is more in uh, creativity, photography, um, TV, movies, whatever else. This is more open platform for different uses. So like I said, um, I have some information I can share with you guys. Uh, if you want to see more new stories, you can be able to ask about drones. Um, or keep up kind of what I'm doing. I write stories and other things. Or if you, you know, sometimes you go to a presentation like this and you, you think about it for a while and you may have questions later, you can always uh, contact me here. I try and, and always answer questions and try and emails from anybody who emails me. Sometimes things may be a little hectic. Um, I think my schedule is extremely uh, fluid, I'd say. And I may be in some other part of the world, I may be in some other part of the country at a moment's notice, but I always try and get back. So that pretty much wraps uh, up what I had to prepare. So there are these questions. Uh, I'm Benny Paris from Chicago. Uh, what do you think, I guess, will be the most recent, uh, the newest use of drones in the commercial field? Well, you know, we're kind of in a, we're kind of in a, let's say, the period with drones, there's a lot of people that are out there using them commercially right now. You know, some of you that you know about drones, you may have seen that uh, the FAA said it's illegal and it can't use drones. Um, that's not stopping a lot of people. It stops me uh, because I <coughs> interface with the FAA on a regular basis, and I don't really want to be out there breaking the law and then trying to interface with the FAA. But so many industries are all you. If you, if, if, uh, you know, if you watch cable TV, if you watch movies, if you watch uh, regular TV, you see more time with your own. Movie industry really likes it. The, uh, I don't know, uh, it was the last James Bond movie? I think it was the last James Bond movie. Anybody see that? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I think they are on the Academy Award for the other things they shot on the uh, Harry Potter. That series with lots of uh, footage that was shot off of the drone. Uh, you're going to see it in some of the agriculture. You're going to see it. Uh, the police are going to want to use these systems. There's issues with privacy and whatever else, but I think we're going to pass all of that. Uh, the, the, the job that I just wanted to talk to some people about, I think public and private asset management is going to be a big deal for drones. You can monitor pipelines and uh, power lines, shore lines, levees, roads, bridges, things that we use every day and that our public officials monitor the health of. Uh, I think that they'll also add efficiency to, you know, uh, let's say the ways that we get around. The railroads will use them. Uh, again, I think they'll be used for, right now they have cameras up there to monitor intersections and whatever else. We can monitor traffic. Uh, we can do that with drone, satellite, cameras on poles, 
all of this information here can be kind of collated in one place to hopefully make our life more efficient, how we get to work, school, whatever else. As far as you know, people ask me that all the time, they say, well, you know, what, what, what do you think of uh, will be this new use for them? And I really don't think that we will know them all until we have real regulation. States. Other countries, and we can use them legally, there's about 31 countries in Europe where you can use uh, commercial drones. And there's over 1,300 that's operating. In Japan, they use, there's, there's 14,000 certificated operators who fly unmanned helicopters for agricultural work. The model for a Japanese farm is a little bit different than the farms in the United States. But it really worked for them because they have small farms. Mining industry wants to use them. The oil and the gas industry wants to use them. Everybody wants to use them. So when we get that regulation, I think you'll see all these different uses pop up for drones. Uh, a lot of people really like the novelty uses, like you know, taco copter and burrito bomber, and you know, and like a beer delivery drone, for ice fishermen and whatever else. So, the novelty is some people really kind of gravitate to that, uh, you know, we'll, maybe one day we will have Amazon drive on fire DVDs by the road. I don't think they're really ready for that time yet, but I know that Amazon is very prone to them, not only the us, but also the stuff. Did I answer your question? Thank you. There's another one in the back. Go ahead. All right, Kevin Fields from California. Do you see any uses in ground drones? You know, like ground robots? It's a just a feature. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I see tons. Uh, I, you, can, you can already kind of see them in our everyday life. If you look at the construction sites, I noticed the other day there was a, there was a guy uh, was some sort of drilling machine to put to drill like pipe, you know, I guess gas pipe or whatever. Um, and he's operating a system. Be a remote control, standing over there operating. I don't know if you guys get to train yards or whatever, but how they operate train yards now. Most of those diesel locomotives, there's a guy, and he's got a big yellow box with sticks on it, and he's flying the train. There's nobody in the train. And he's got multiple trains that he's flying. So, I mean, technically, it's a remotely piloted vehicle, it's a ground machine. But I do believe that you're going to see robots in the future doing security. You know, around like airports or factories or whatever else. You'll have them, they'll have a camera mounted on them, they'll be able to control the perimeter. A lot of the vehicles in open pit mining are going autonomous, like the huge dump trucks. They basically come up a spiral that come out of the uh, out of the open pit mine. Those trucks are automated. So more and more I think you're gonna see automated systems in industry. Uh, also with the automated cars, kind of a ground vehicle. Uh, to me, I think it's kind of exciting that I would be able to work or do something else instead of have to drive my car in traffic, which we have tons of here. You guys probably can enjoy some of that while you're here. So I think it would be uh, all kinds of uh, uses for ground robots, and also in the medical field. Uh, then the other thing that we have here in um, Silicon Valley, we have the Silicon Valley Robotics Block Party. People come from all over the world and check it out. And there are different robot prototypes, ones that are, are will come and just dispense drugs to you in the hospital, they can come to your room and dispense whatever the doctor has prescribed for you. There are also there's some companies that have a startup where they actually have a ground robot that has an LCD screen on it. And it's kind of interesting. I saw this in Robo Business and also the Silicon Valley Robotics Block Party where it can drive around the room and it's a telepresence and you can interact with the person on the screen, like a person on Skype or FaceTime. They have the mobility that they can drive all around this campus and the sky's the limit as far as fun. whatever you can dream of, let's say a robot to do, either land, sea, air, space, whatever. And if you can figure out the screen to support what you want to do, I, I would say uh, there are no limits. Really sure. I'm Nicholas Stark from Oklahoma. Uh, I was just 
speaking of dreaming, I was just wondering if there was anything that you personally might have thought of uses for the drones that maybe hasn't really been considered before. Mm -hmm. um, well, you know, I had lots of ideas. I have one to, uh, I want to, I, I, I was trying to think of like more the drones, you know, people say drones for good, or humanitarian things that you can do with drones. One of the things that I would like to do with drones when I catch, catch my breath and catch up a little bit of time is to uh, land my feet. When I say land my feet, there's and the statistics on landmines around the world. We don't really have to contend with here in the United States. We don't really have to deal with conflict where landmines were put out. But millions and millions of landmines are in the ground around the world right now. Some and there are from all these different conflicts, Southeast Asia. There's landmines in North Africa that have been, were laid by the Germans and the English and the Americans in the World War II. They tell people don't get off the road. So the, the real tragedy with landmines is that people step on them to make the kids or animals or people hurting animals or lose a leg or their life or whatever else. And really what I'd like to do is develop a system with drones that goes out there, maps and finds them, and then also goes out and defeats them. And I think that that would be a good humanitarian use of drones. The taco copter is nice. Perhaps I might talk about a piece of copter and all that stuff. But that's what I'd like to do is go out and help the world. Where are you on that east coast of Oklahoma? What? Are you on the east eastern side of I'm sorry, east coast of the eastern side of Oklahoma? Uh, yeah, on the south east. What town? Uh, how? I don't really know, but well, my podcast is just kind of the uh, Oklahoma Secretary for Science and Technology. He's talking about all of the aerospace and the drone things that they're getting in Oklahoma. Actually, your governor is a very pro drone governor, very proud. She's uh, very big into aeronautics and technology. So, it's a good, good thing to do for you. Bye, you. Hi, I'm Rosa from California. I'm just wondering, what do you think is like the most useful and what are ways to go today? Well, you know, again, uh, a lot of those are uh, humanitarian uh, uses that I think of, but I'd really like to see, like if they said, hey, what could we, what could we do that would be beneficial right now? Um, I think that in California, and you have forest fires. It'd be nice to be able to manage uh, our forest better in our state parks and national parks. Uh, manage these for us and maybe uh, help the firefighters. A few years ago, there was a real tragedy where I think about 13 firefighters got taken into the flames, blew back, and they're overwhelmed and they died. And I think that this technology applied uh, to that type of situation can save people's homes, can save trees. A lot of these trees take, I don't know if you guys are going to get out into you know, woods or whatever, but I mean, a lot of these old growth trees just take hundreds of thousands of years to grow, and it's kind of a shame to see them destroyed. I think drones can help, uh, help save those trees, help save those forests, help save those lives. That's, that's what I think. The movie thing is neat, too, but uh, that's what I think. Any other questions? This hand shot is very simple. And I was wondering if you thought that uh, drones would become a prevailing factor in emergency response in the near future, not so much with law enforcement, but more with medical personnel. Um, and if so, how long do you think it will be before that becomes? Uh, well, there are a couple companies that want to use them to deliver pharmaceuticals to people that say that live up to A lot of people in the world that live beyond One easy example would be like the Eskimos in Alaska. Uh, a lot of those people very far out there and it's hard for them to get anywhere or to get things delivered to them. And so this concept is to deliver the prescription by drone. So that would be one example. Uh, I think that there's also there's already people doing search and rescue and uh, find people that have wandered off either Alzheimer's patients or children or whatever else. I also think that uh, you could do kind of situational awareness with drones. I know that there were efforts in other guys in New Zealand had a helicopter that was unmanned that he wanted to develop for cities. 
His main concept was to rescue hikers uh, or mountain climbers like on the Andres, since they were dead. So, you know, people have thought about solving that problem already. And I think it's, it's totally viable as something that can be done. It's just regulation. Pollution. <laughs> Well, here's what, here's the, you know, I was talking about this this morning. Here's the thing with drones. Drones afford, let's say, almost any industry efficiency. There are a lot of industries that we take for granted that use aerial photography. But the issue with taking aerial photography the old way is, is you have to call a pilot or a company. And usually what he does is stack up jobs so it's equitable for him. So you may not get your photography for three weeks. And then you have to tell him what you want. He goes out there and takes the pictures. He comes back and finally gets your pictures. A lot of the time, it's not really what you wanted. So you have to pay him again to go out there and get those. So it may be a six week or eight week span. We get the aerial photography, the images, the data that you need. And again, it may not be what you want. What this technology allows people to do, map makers, uh, scientists, it allows you to go collect the data that you need for your problem by yourself. I could go out for a thousand bucks and I could go buy this. I've got a buddy at uh, NASA that I've been friends with for a long time. They go down to Costa Rica and there's a volcano down there that I can get it. Same. But anyway, they off gases, toxic fumes, carbon dioxide, and other nasty stuff. We obviously can't jump a plane and fly through that because that gas does not support life and you will die from crashing the volcano down or cause an international incident. We don't want to do that. But I can take this guy here, and usually that stick on there, and you put some sort of gas sniffing device on here, and you can fly this through there all day long and collect gas samples. I was going to do another one where I was going to fly a we want to try and do some stuff. These sensors that uh, they're using to sniff gases and water are also now are being miniaturized. Uh, a lot of the technology again from space is coming out. They have laser-based gas sniffers. So they're really high. You can find them on any one of these systems. So I guess that would kind of be one example of how uh, efficiency and taking the man out of the equation uh, is beneficial. Well, I, I'm Steve from Rhode Island, one of the social leaders, and uh, I just want to share an experience. I was just brought in those three from the slot, and they were using the drones to help fly with rejects um, with employment and controlling the drone fly over to be a reach inspector. So I thought that was a great experience I wanted to share. Um, I think how I help others. It is. And, you know, I mean, it, it's another point that you're hitting on, is this is like, a, again, a remote presence. And it's one thing with, let's say, remotely piloted systems, air, ground, sea, or whatever. People with, with disabilities, they can, uh, they can use them and they can start businesses, just like you said. The other thing that was an idea, I was talking to guys from the uh, Department of the Interior, and one of them was talking about taking these and doing uh, a virtual tour of the national parks in HD. You know, I can go send me and after them and all that stuff. I'm in pretty good shape, but I don't think I could you know, climb the face of the path that I have to probably train for that, put a little weight and that, yeah. But uh, the idea with that, I thought it was great. So you have to, uh, people that aren't like, so physically able to do it, or, you know, maybe they're older, or they live in some part of the world, but they just can never get there. But you know what? They too can enjoy the beauty of nature or visit some site if you're over. So those are other, um, let's say, other, other things that, that this technology affords people to do. There were a couple of questions there. Um, you said that you had a news channel, correct? Um, I do. What do you guys talk about? Well, you know, I do, I do a podcast. I've been doing a podcast since uh, the beginning of 2012. 
very focused at about 225,000 What I usually do is I either uh, complain about the uh, FAA and their lack of movement, which I do a lot of that. Because I really think the regulatory part of this is the only thing that's really holding us back from realizing the promise of the Other thing I do is I like to get scientists on that show. I got a gentleman on from NOAA. And, uh, you know, they're using drones, fixed, fixed wing drones, mainly, to fly and dive hurricanes, and they do that. That's another deal where you can get a manned aircraft, and they do a little bit of a hurricane, and they do a scare, and they do a little bit. And uh, so, you know, you can use that and do that. Um, so you start talking to these scientists. You say, okay, well, what is the government for you? And, and the common theme or thread is, is that it allows them to collect data that there's no other way for them to collect. So it's all of this new data, you know, it's like, oh, God, it's great. And then I really like to get the scientists uh, screwed up on what their passion is. So you have a guy on the middle. And I'm like, okay, well, you know, let's digress a little bit. And we'll talk about how a hurricane forms. And, you know, it really has to be early. You know, time people, well, it really has to kind of be the perfect mixture of, of temperature and moisture and difference between the temperature of the air and the sea and the energy that comes out of the ocean and you know, I think from and you learn all this stuff. And and uh, the science and technology guy from Oklahoma. He was a radiation guy. And okay? that that was his background. Like, oh yeah, I'm sure you thought about putting radiation stampers on drones. You know, it's like, oh yeah, you know, you've got Fukushima and that happened they actually had the drone and they set it in there and it measured radiation uh, levels which were those radiation levels were not supported by the way to go in there with the drone. But again, talking to him, I want to talk, I got off track, I want to talk about one of the main issues in space travel, radiation. We haven't really looked at that problem yet. But, as, uh, as the gentleman on the show said, as you know, we're going to need material to science, so that, that will shield radiation, which will be very expensive. So that's really what I like to talk about. Experts on how you use the technology and really kind of throw down into what their expertise is, put them up and let them go. So there's 80 programs. I, you know, you can come up here after and get cards. And if you want to listen to me uh, talk about different types of gathering opportunities, I also do uh, room TV. There's several episodes of that. A lot of belly aching about the FAA, but also we uh, did an episode of Rescue. We did a safety episode where basically it talks about how to operate the system safely. That's another thing to consider. A lot of people think, oh, I'm going to order up the drone off of Amazon, I'm going to fly it over there, and you're going nuts. Well, you know, there's already people in that occupied space, and there are people that fly planes. And you guys, probably everybody, almost everybody here, will let you get here, right? A lot of people really don't want to, what we wouldn't want is to have one of these get sucked through a jet. That would probably uh, cause an issue. <laughs> I don't want to be on that point. Let me just put it that way. So, you know, there's the responsible use of the airspace. And you have to think that there are people there. And I did an episode on that. And we went to NAB, which was pretty exciting. Uh, NAB is the National Association of Broadcasters in Las Vegas. And you think, oh, we go there and see, you know, cameras and movie or uh, video cameras and all that stuff. Well, it was really a drone show. Tons of these drones. Almost every booth, Sony had drones in their booth. Uh, news stations had drones in their booth. This is the, the news gathering room. Uh, and I think that more and more you're going to see drones at, let's say, Less on the aviation shows, and more on the consumer electronic shows. So that's, I think, drones just going to come into the culture. But those are the kinds of things I talk about on that. Well, some more questions, yes. Okay, sure, sure, sure. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm going to ask that. I was just wondering, what, what's the range of the more industrial journeys? Like, how close do you have to the fall of the platform for the same thing as that? Well, you know, it's interesting that you say that. Is, uh, really, it's kind of a line of sight. And what I mean by line of sight, the picture, you know, the picture is there. If I'm flying below the top of the mountains, the radio line of sight is not going to be out over the mountains. But, you know, above those mountains, 
and then we can go find a site to go further. But right now, you can go out on the internet. That internet is that, you know, we had some wonderful stuff out there. Uh, and there's a module that you can put on a radio like this for a hundred thousand dollars. I think it's called Dragon. And the way that it is, Some of the American military systems, like Shadow, uh, they would say, well, we could fly out to 65 kilometers on the site. Uh, that's going to cost about $2 million, going to move about 19 million. That's great. That's not a great system. You can do that with a radio and a plane like this. It's probably cost you about $45,000 to do that. The other thing, and I, didn't, I don't have the equipment, but a lot of uh, things that people do is they wear goggles, like this, this plane has a camera in the nose, and they'll wear goggles and it's called uh, FPV, or first, player, first person video. And basically what it's like is the video that you're getting is like sitting in the cockpit of the airplane. And there are people that do that all over the world. And they, uh, they fly around, it's just like being in the plane, you're perfectly being in the plane, but you're not in the plane, you're in that plane. And uh, again, that's another thing. People do that 45 kilometers away. Where is that? Where are you going? Uh, over here. Have you ever been to it? Maybe it's all there? Yeah, we have. Yeah, it looks nice. You know, it's, uh, it's a nice country. And it's uh, someday I hope you'll get over there. Do you have any more questions? What is it? Hey, I'm just um, I was just wondering if you had any more, any more about the same regards to the FAA and the privacy of the individual. Well, how much time do you have? Because uh, I can probably do 10 hours of that. Um, you know, the FAA, like you said, because I said the Associated Administrator of Aviation Safety, and you know, and uh, right currently there's another unmanned aircraft system in the aviation law making process. And there's no legal on that committee that has the interest of small business in that in mind. And I think that that's a real tragedy. Most of the people that are on that are military people. Or let's say manufacturers of military systems like Kumo or Raven or everybody knows what a Predator drone is, uh, the companies that make that. And they're on this arc and they're going to be uh, making the rules for maybe people like you that want to be in this which I think is a problem. I don't really want to use the asymmetrical warfare model for agriculture. Or I don't really want to use that model for, uh, let's say, construction, mining, or whatever. It, it, it doesn't work. So really, the FAA, I think, is to step back, take a look at it, and really get more involved and have more people that want to use this or are using it in business get the information from them on how we operate. I talk to people about privacy all the time. And when you do this as a business, even the photos that I had, really when your aircraft is in the air, operating in a three or four D environment, uh, it has peril. So you can always crash to so risking your, your uh, equipment. One. Two, if you're doing it as a job, you're really there and you want to be efficient. I'm not really there to look at people's windows or do anything else. I'm there to get the picture that I was hired to take. I'm going to take that picture and then go. Now, is that going to, let's say, are there not going to be any bad outcomes out there that use these for like paparazzi photos or you know, something that's it's kind of funny that will pop up over the things to take a picture of their expert? Now, this is a school or whatever, it's going to be kind of funny when you get to put it on Instagram or whatever. You know, they <sighs> may come over to some people. But I would just say, you know, it's up to the person, the person who operates that to be, you can say, responsible. You can't regulate stupid. People are going to do stupid stuff. You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? It's out there on the internet. It's a little weird. People are doing stupid stuff. So, uh, I do think that there could be some common sense regulation. The other thing that I've done is I've come up with uh, a under four pound exemption, which would allow someone to fly one of these smaller systems like this without the pilot's license, 
Uh, you know, you may have to do some uh, an online study, take a couple of tests, but by and large, you can operate this. You know, you can operate it on a web feed, operate it with a digital website. And you would maybe do jobs like take pictures from real estate agents um, or you know, something along those lines, or maybe for your church, something like that. You might want to help them out and do something, and that shouldn't be that uh, words for the bias. I don't think you need to have a pilot's license. I don't think you have to have a class to medical. I don't think you have to have aircraft certification. All of that regulation turns this into from a thousand dollar system into like a three thousand, four thousand dollar system. Obviously that's gonna block more businesses out of the business. Any other questions? Go ahead. As long as there's time, I'll I don't have time. Blue shirt? Yeah. See you in a minute. Anybody else? This will, we'll do, this will be the last question. Okay. Hi, I'm Kathleen Tennessee. And um, I was wondering if you thought there might be a future of unemployment issues with drones maybe replacing jobs that are previously done by people. I hear that one a lot about robotics. <laughs> There are people that would love to uh, put people at work. One of them is uh, FedEx. Okay, I think forget the president's last name, but the guy that owns FedEx has always been a real big proponent of a main aircraft. Because he said, why do I want to pay these pilots when I could just pay a system operator, some guy that's located at the airport with a computer and he's flying four or five different jets around doing a cargo. A lot of these jobs, um, it's kind of like the new economy job. It's the same thing. People send it out to the cloud, and now you're living in the internet, and you don't need this person anymore. You don't need this person to do this, blah, blah, blah. And they, and they are going to shift. And certain, some certain jobs are going to shift. But I, I look at robots as being kind of like a big part, and the same with the drones. Uh, one, they're a tool, but they're also going to, you know, everybody's going to go out. A lot of people say these are old, dirty, and dangerous jobs. One of them was like robots. You know, you get a robot to run the lawn. I'm not allowed to do the dishes. Yeah. A lot of jobs I don't like doing. Um, so again, if, if, like with the example of the volcano, I think it will open up some new opportunities for new jobs and new study. And uh, you know, maybe you'll be the drone pilot for Solar City. You know, that's a new job. Uh, solar City, they come and put solar panels on your airplane. <coughs> Around and the guy flies and takes you know, pictures of the roof and what the layout's going to be and if the roof's ready to receive the solar panels, things like that. Some of the other roofs are going to be shot with that. Some of the roofs are going to be shot with that. These are going to be exciting. Thank you very much.